Hello, good evening. Hi, everyone. Now, uh, where are we? Half past five. Now, good evening. Welcome to Stowe Talks. Now, tonight's session is continuing on a theme that we've been doing for a bit recently. Uh, tonight's session is how to recognise abuse in long term relationships. And it's a serious topic. You know it's a serious topic, it's what you signed up to hear about. Um, we've covered domestic abuse several times on here before and we will continue to do so. It's going to be a subject that we're always going to be talking about, I'm afraid. Um, but we're talking about uh, abusive relationships and, and how to spot them, I suppose, is, is the main uh, theme here. As we all know, abusive relationships very rarely start out as obviously abusive. Um, Behaviour starts subtly and it builds over time and we addressed that last month in um, last month's Stow Talks and you can get the recording um, of that um, if you'd like to listen to it. Now we know what the effects of being an abusive, being in a, an abusive relationship are. Victims are frequently left isolated, uh, trapped, confused, um, today we're going to be talking about um, what is domestic abuse, um, we're going to be talking about the signs of abuse in a long-term relationship, uh, the impact on the survivor, um, and how to exit an abusive relationship as safely as possible, and the best bit, uh, life after abuse. Um, to be clear, tonight's session obviously it's, it's not gender specific, it's frequently harder for for men to come forward um, as victims of abuse, which is why the statistics are quite slow in, in catching up in an area where we know um, it is, where we know men are almost as, as, as much victims as, as women are. Um, if we ever refer to an abuser on these webinars as a, as a him, this is not intentional. We do know that men are victims um, of abuse and that uh, it's on the increase, I'm afraid. Uh, just for reassurance, the, the law is, is, is also gender neutral uh, in this area. Now, um, tonight, I'm really pleased to welcome back Karen Kipping. Now, um, Karen is one of my favorite guests on Snow Talks. Karen is um, an experienced divorce and separation coach. Um, but she's very unique because of her background story. She's unique because of the length of time that she's spent working in the domestic abuse sector. Now, she's been through abuse herself. Um, she's had a very difficult divorce and she now spends her time sharing her knowledge and also helping others. Um, I must admit, I am very, very fond of Karen's book. If you don't know what it is, it's called uh, Recognition to Recovery, How to Leave Your Abusive X behind you for good. I've got my, I'm not sure if you can see me on the screen. I've got my sticky notes in the book here already. I do refer to it and I do recommend it to clients or people I know having a difficult time. I also recommend it to my fellow lawyers. So I do rate it as a very good book. Now, tonight's session is going to be uh, fairly practical. It's going to be empowering. Our goal is to help you feel more in control of knowing what the signs of abuse are, knowing what your options are, um, but also knowing how to help, how to help yourself um, and how to help someone else in an abusive relationship. We do obviously relish bringing you the harder aspects of family law, but tonight's session is, is going to be full of a lot of practical tips, obviously. Um, now, uh, in terms of our audience, hi everyone. Um, we are expecting there may be some new listeners with us tonight, um, but we also welcome back old friends. You may have registered to attend tonight because you you are sadly in an abusive relationship um, or you may be uh, connected to someone who's in a relationship and you know that they need to get out of it. Um, you may be uh, a fellow lawyer, you may be a law student or a counsellor or someone just looking to broaden your knowledge in what is a really difficult area. So we welcome you. Um, it's lovely to have you with us, thanks very much. Um, as I've said before, um, the content of Stowe Talks is driven by the feedback we get from you. The topics, obviously, uh, we, we, we choose our topics uh, in line with what people would like to hear about and experts that people would like to get to know. So please do give us feedback. 
Um, we, we do welcome it, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly, not a problem. We are lawyers first and foremost, not presenters or podcasters, but um, we love to hear from you. Now, in terms of housekeeping tonight, we are recording the session as we always do. Um, for questions, we've got the Q&A function at the top of your Zoom page there. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A bit, but we've also enabled the chat function as usual. So please feel free to let us have your comments um, in there. Be kind to each other. I know you always are, but I have to remind people that um, you, you know, kindness is, is how we operate. Um, and and that's, I think, all we need to, I need to say. The, the presentation, sorry, the format tonight is as it has been before. So we're going to do Karen's presentation and then we're going to have plenty of time for, for questions um, at a later date. Sorry, at a later date, at a later time in the session. Um, and feel free to just uh, ping us over everything that you want to know and we'll go from there. So, Karen, are you there? I, I am. See you. I am. Oh, great. See you now. Fabulous. Great. Um, I'll hand over to you. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so good to be here again, raising a bit more awareness and hopefully sharing lots of tips and advice and guidance to help people who are perhaps questioning whether they are in an abusive relationship or starting to come to terms with that and starting to understand it. Hopefully this presentation will give you a bit of validation around that and some positive things to take away from it. So let's start. So first of all, what is domestic abuse? Still, even, you know, many, many years on, uh, from when I started working in this sector, people still think that physical abuse cons is the is the main constitution of domestic abuse, the main aspect. Um, it's actually not. The vast majority of my clients uh, and all my clients are experiencing some form of domestic abuse, but the vast majority of my clients are actually not experiencing physical abuse at all and never have. Quite often, the physical abuse comes much later in a relationship, quite often around the point of separation or when that abuser feels like they are starting to lose control, that the more subtle tactics that they have been using and that have been working are no longer as effective. So they have to up the ante and, uh, and then the physical abuse starts. And physical abuse can be anything from poking and prodding and, uh, you know, unwanted touching and to, to obviously the other end of the spectrum where you've got full on, you know, um, punching and slapping and hair pulling and things like that um, uh, and leaving injuries. So with physical abuse, it is very much a spectrum. You know, there are two ends of the spectrum, the mild end and the severe end. Um, but if you're not experiencing physical physical abuse, don't assume that your relationship is safe. Don't assume that it is healthy, okay? Because um, the toughest aspect of domestic abuse is the emotional abuse. It's the stuff that people say to you. The words that they use are very difficult to unhear once you've heard them. And that constant emotional abuse is very, very exhausting. And uh, a lot of, again, a lot of people who are trying to come out of these types of relationships say that the emotional abuse is worse than any kind of physical wow. abuse. Because words are very hurtful. And they're very personal and you become very hypersensitive to that kind of stuff. So emotional abuse, um, it can be things like uh, criticisms, constant criticism. Uh, uh, it can be talking very negatively about you. It can be calling you names. It's that real kind of belittling behavior where they're trying to put you down all of the time. And then for the financial abuse, very, very common in abusive relationships is financial abuse um, because people that are abusive are controlling. And quite often the way they like to control you are through the finances and often through the children as well. So with financial abuse, it can be things like not having access to your own money, 
um in long-term relationships you know you may not have worked for several years while you've been bringing up the children perhaps and that may be may have seemed like a good idea at the time but you know maybe after 15 20 years of of that marriage that relationship you start to realize how unhappy you are and then start to think about separating you suddenly realize that actually you've got no financial independence you've got no bank account you've got no assets in your name and so that can make leaving and separation very very difficult um with sexual abuse again it's a spectrum um with sexual abuse it can be where they are putting pressure on you to do things that you don't necessarily want to do you might not feel you have a right to say no to having sex um you know maybe your spouse feels that they are entitled to have sex with you whenever they want because you are married um they are not that that is not okay you are entitled to say no but this pressure that they put you under can be very difficult to say no to. And this can be one aspect of what we call coercive control. And coercive control is the subtle tactics that creep in over time. The things that do make you feel dependent on the other person, that make you feel like you don't have a right to an opinion that make you feel like you have no support system and that you can't leave. And coercive control is very, very powerful. So when people say, well, you should just leave, it's not that easy. So we have spoken in previous webinars about the warning, early warning signs of abuse in a relationship when you're in the early days in the honeymoon period, etc. But actually spotting signs of abuse when you're already connected to that person and you've been in that relationship for a long time can be very difficult. I have a lot of people that come to me, men and women, who really struggle to recognize abusive behavior when they've been in a relationship for a long time. They will come and say, you know, am I being a bit oversensitive? You know, maybe they're just a bit selfish. Maybe we just have different ways of parenting. Maybe we just have grown apart. But actually, when we start to drill down to some of the behaviors, it's very obvious that actually there has been coercive control throughout the relationship. They just haven't spotted it. It's very difficult to see when you're in it. And quite often it's at the time of separation or afterwards when you've got a bit more headspace from your ex or soon to be ex that you are able to reflect a bit on your relationship and look back and go, oh, yeah, I remember back in the early days they used to do this, they used to do that. And sometimes after separation, the abusive behaviour becomes much more evident. So I had a lady today, for example, who contacted me for the first time and she's been separated for a year from her husband of 20 years. And she's only just starting to recognise that it's actually been a very coercive and controlling marriage throughout, but she just didn't see it. And um, one of the ways that you might start to recognise abuse in your relationship is when you perhaps have been in that relationship for many years and suddenly you start to realise that you've lost all your friendships. You maybe have lost friends and maybe not been allowed to speak or see your family as much as you perhaps would have wanted to. I know clients that have not been able to spend time with their family at Christmas, for example, for many years. And sometimes you start to reflect and you start to realise that actually you have become incredibly isolated. Your world has become much smaller over the years. You know, perhaps at the beginning of the relationship, you did have lots of friends. You were very sociable. You used to go out to work. Um, but, you know, then the dynamics change. You perhaps had children. 
You maybe then didn't work so much, maybe you didn't have to work. And that can seem like quite a good idea at the time. But maybe it was actually financially abusive. Maybe the intention of your spouse was to isolate you, to keep you at home, to stop you from being around other people, to stop you from having access to your own money. And maybe you're you're becoming really tired and exhausted and worn down from years of constant criticism and belittling and being put down. You can perhaps start to think, well, I can't do anything right. I can never do anything right. And that can really kind of grate on you after a while. But, you know, you might just dismiss it a little bit in the early days. You might just think, oh, well, you know, it's fine. I can manage it. I can put up with it. But actually, after years and years, it can really, really drag you down. And actually, some of the abuse can feel very normal when it has become a pattern of behavior over years and years. It can become very normal. And I have clients that tell me some quite horrendous behaviors, quite frankly, but they talk about it quite matter of fact because it's just part of their day to day life living with this person. And what you might also start to recognize after many years of being in a relationship is that you are on this constant hamster wheel, this cycle of abuse where things are okay for a while, but then something will trigger an incident. Something may start to get your partner partner wound up, uh, angry, frustrated about, you know, it could be anything. It could be something that you've done. It could be something that you haven't done. It could be any excuse that they can come up with really to have a go at you. But then there'll be a big explosion, big falling out, perhaps a big argument, they might sulk or they might apologise and then things might be better for a little bit. They might promise to go to marriage counselling, to get therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And it's okay for a while. But then, of course, gradually that abusive behaviour creeps in again and you're back on that hamster wheel going round and round again. And again, you know, that is very, very exhausting after years and years. And you might also notice abusive behaviour a bit more when there is a change in the family dynamics. So perhaps your children are are growing up. They're becoming more independent. They're not needing you as much. They've got their own little lives. They might be leaving home. And suddenly you're in the home with your partner um, a lot more. And then you start to really see their behavior for what it is and it can become very tense and you know you can suddenly feel very alone maybe the children have been the buffer for his behavior maybe you've managed to focus on the children and not really had enough time to really look at your own needs but suddenly you know when the children have gone you suddenly start to think about that and what life is going to be like for the next few years so that, that can be a few of the ways that you might start to, to realise that things aren't okay. So how does it impact on you? Uh, you might feel like you are walking on eggshells. This term walking on eggshells means when you are constantly anxious, you're constantly worried, fearful about your partner's reaction to things. You're constantly worried about getting things wrong, getting into trouble, getting told off. And it really impacts on your mental health, um, especially when you've put up with that for many, many years. You, You may think that you are coping, but underneath it all, you may not be coping very well. So you may suffer a lot with anxiety, with panic attacks, with not sleeping, with feeling exhausted. Uh, You may feel depressed. So, you know, you might feel like you just wanted to stop. You might even feel suicidal at some points, like you just can't take it anymore. And it, it, it really impacts on your physical health too. So you might have headaches. You might have hair loss from stress. You may notice that you just don't have 
the energy that you used to have. And a lot of people suffer with um, chronic joint pain as well. And um, that's a, a very common uh, physical health symptom. Things like ME, chronic fatigue, they are all exacerbated by long-term stress. So it's really important that you do go and see your GP and get checked out in terms of your mental health and your physical health. I have lots of clients that are taking homeopathic remedies for anxiety and for sleeping and who are on antidepressants or anti-anxiety tablets. There is really no shame in taking any of those kind of remedies. Um, when you've been dealing with such a lot of pressure for such a long time, you know, you're not a robot. Of course, it's going to impact on you. OK, but as well as 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 getting some help to cope with the symptoms and the impact of it, obviously, you need to work on the practicalities of changing um, the situation. But there are challenges that come with leaving a long term relationship. You know, who wants to start again after 15, 20 years of marriage? Of course, you don't really. But you know you have two choices you either put up with it which is not really the best option or the greatest option or you find a way to leave to end the relationship um it's not easy and your partner your spouse isn't going to make it easy but it absolutely can be done it's about getting the right advice and guidance and practical help and you may find that you don't have much of a support network around you because you've lost your friends and your world has become smaller. So that can definitely be a challenge. Uh, the lack of finances can also be a challenge. You know, how you actually fund the practicalities of leaving, you know, how you fund a place to live if you can't stay in the marital home, how you fund your legal advice, um, so that can definitely be a challenge. And of course, everybody is going to have an opinion about what you should and shouldn't do. Maybe your children will have an opinion about whether you should separate or not. Maybe your friends or your family, you know, may just say, well, you, you know, you've got a decent lifestyle. Maybe you should just carry on. But you have to trust your gut instinct. And if it doesn't feel right, if you've had enough, OK, there really isn't another option. You just have to grit your teeth and follow through. So, yeah, trust your gut instinct. You know your partner better than anybody else. And if you've had enough, you've had enough. And it's time to start putting yourself first. You can spend many years putting other people first, putting your children first, putting your abusive partner first. But actually, your needs matter too. And if you're not happy, you're not happy. And you don't need to stay in an abusive relationship. There is no perfect time to end it. Some people will say, oh, well, I wish I'd left when my children were small. There's pros and cons to that. There's pros and cons to leaving when your children are older. You're not going to have to go through family court, for one thing. You know, when your children are older, they're able to manage their own relationship with their, you know, their parents. So, you know, it, it could be relatively straightforward if, if it's really just financial issues that you're having to deal with. So, you know, that could be a, a, a plus. So you absolutely have to stay focused. Of course, your soon-to-be ex isn't going to like the fact that you have suddenly, oh, in their mind, suddenly, <laughs> you may have been thinking about it for years, but in their eyes, you know, suddenly decided to end the relationship. So you have to be prepared that they're not going to make it easy. They're going to try and make you feel guilty for doing it. They're going to try and make you believe that you're not going to cope afterwards. Um, but all of this is manipulation designed to get you to back off because they want things to stay the same. But you don't have to rush into making any big decisions Again, it can be quite daunting to make big decisions if you've never been allowed to make any decisions at all for many years. But you are you can absolutely be capable of making these decisions. Again, it's about getting the right information, understanding your rights and getting people to help you. But you don't have to rush. 
definitely keep your options open. Don't discount any kind of option. So I have a lot of people that say, well, I definitely want to stay in the marital home. That may be how you feel initially, but you may well change your mind, you know, within a few months, because quite often there's a lot of negative emotions attached to a marital home. So you might actually change your mind and decide that you're quite happy to downsize and to have a fresh start somewhere else. So don't discount any of the options and definitely trust your judgment. Uh, if it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. Uh, and again, everybody will have an opinion about what you should and shouldn't do practically. You have to go down the route that feels right for you. There we are. Sorry, it just froze for a minute. So how to leave an abusive relationship safely? Definitely try to plan, get your ducks in a row, get all your information together, know exactly what your next step is before you have the conversation, before you push the button on the divorce, on the separation. So understand your rights and options, get all that professional advice, and build, try to start building up your support team, start reaching out to people, reconnecting perhaps with friends that you've lost touch with, with family members, or making new friends or new connections so that you feel you've got a real team of people around you. And that may be a team of professionals. So it might be a solicitor, it might be somebody like a divorce coach, it might be a financial advisor. There can be all sorts of people that can help you. And definitely start being honest with other people. You've protected this person for a long time and that's how they've got away with this behaviour. Sometimes you have to be honest about their behaviour. Stop covering up for them. But you have to keep safe always. So definitely while you're still living under the same roof, you have to be very mindful of your safety. So you may have to act normal for a while you may have to just walk away from them to make sure that the situation doesn't escalate um and yeah you may have to just try to manage things carefully at each stage okay at some point you may decide that you have to move out because it's just too tough living under the same roof whilst the separation is taking place but you know take it one step at a time Safety always has to come first, even if they've never been physically abusive before. So what support is available? There's a really brilliant web website called The Rights of Women that I direct people to a lot. Um, a lot of the information is written up by trainee barristers. It's very easy to read. It's very, you know, there, there are lots of guides there and they have some helplines as well. Um, so that can be a useful starting point. There are government pages for the relevant legal forms and for guidance again on divorce and court and the legal options. There's a lot of information out there. Um, in terms of legal professionals, again, you might want to tap into various different professionals at different points, depending on your situation, depending on what kinds of assets you've got connected with your spouse, depending on your particular financial situation and how complex it is. And getting information from the experts is absolutely key and can give you real clarity and confidence about what you're doing and about what you're, you may be entitled to and what your long-term future might look like. In terms of the local authority, they have housing teams of specialists that are very um, uh, well used to dealing with people who are experiencing domestic abuse and coercive control. So they can advise you on your housing options. Um, adult social care, again, you know, if you, especially if you've got particular vulnerabilities, if you've got mental health vulnerabilities, if you've got disabilities, additional needs, 
um, social care, adult social care can be a real support. So divorce coaches like myself, um, we hold your hand as you go through the process. Divorce coaches work differently. So it's definitely worth doing your research and figuring out, you know, that particular coach's level of experience and what their particular niche is and how they can help you. Myself, I support people very practically uh, in terms of guiding them through the process. And obviously with that emotional support and connection with other people that are going through similar situations. And uh, community groups and organisations, there are loads of really brilliant community groups and organisations. So again, it's worth Googling, it's worth doing your research in your local area to see what kind of community support is out there, because being able to tap into some of that, again, can really help you feel a lot more confident about what you're doing. And local domestic abuse charity organisations, those organisations like Women's Aid, like Mankind, um, very specialist domestic abuse organisations, again, can be a huge resource for practical help and emotional support. And those kind of community groups, organisations, domestic abuse support, it's all free. So definitely try to tap into some of that. Um, right so building a new life after a long-term abusive relationship it does take time uh you know it's you're not going to come out of a relationship where you've been in that for 20 years and suddenly have a new lease of life it does take time to rebuild it takes time to shift those patterns, those thinking patterns, to change those habits. But you can absolutely embrace your new life. Um, I've got a lot of clients who have suddenly started doing all of the things that they've never been allowed to do for many years. And that's really empowering and freeing and just gives them a new energy. Um, and sometimes it's just the small things. Um, you know, peace is priceless, absolutely. Just being able to have that sense of peace and calm in your own home, being able to wake up in the morning, not being worried about the day, not being worried about being criticised for the smallest things, being able to make your own choices and have those freedoms is absolutely priceless. Um, so, yeah, educating yourself is definitely key to feeling confident. Also keep in mind that this process, this legal process that you're going to have to go through in terms of separation, it does come to an end. It might take a few months um, and it can seem like a really tough time at the time, but it will end. So start visualising your new life. Start thinking about what life could be like without being in this abusive relationship. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative it can be a real positive. Uh, you know, life is too short to be unhappy is my mantra. So keep going. And if that's what you want, absolutely go for it because it's perfectly doable. So here are some lists of organisations, again, that you can tap into. There's lots of information on the websites and, you know, you can call their helplines for advice and guidance and a bit of reassurance. Um, so, yeah, get as much support and help as you can through the process, but it, you absolutely can, can do it. And nobody, you know, needs to stay in an abusive relationship, no matter how long they've been in it. It's never too late, is what I would say. And that's me. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to tap in now and say anything? Absolutely, absolutely. I've made um, my little notes, as I always tend to do. Um, again, obviously, the biggest reminder here is, as you, as you said, uh, safety has to come first. That's my obviously my biggest takeaway. Um, that should be everyone's biggest takeaway. My favourite website, um, we share the same favourite website. I think the Rights of Women website is really well done, isn't it? It's really clever. 
Um, it was a long time overdue. I don't think it's been around that long. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think it has been around quite a long time, but they've just recently updated it, actually. Um, but it's, yeah, it's brilliant. It's got information about finances, about family stuff, about divorce, about if you're not married, you know, in relevant sections, really easy to read for people that don't understand the legal process because it can be very confusing. So that's why I like it. Yes, it's a minefield even for professionals sometimes. <laughs> um, so it is a, diff a difficult one, which is why I liked in your signposting earlier, you were saying, get your professional advice. Um, one of the things we've talked about before on here is that there are a huge amount of family lawyers out there. The majority of law firms will always offer a free appointment in the first instance. So you can go and see somebody for free. It might be half an hour. It might be an hour. There should be somebody local to you. Crikey, you can do a beauty parade. You can go around all of them. That's not a problem. In fact, I do say that you should do that because it's important that you work with a lawyer who you like um, and who you feel gets you and understands your story and hears you um so by all means do that beauty parade um there are other professionals as well out there for example if you are in a situation whereby you've been doing some research there are people that will help you such as mediators they're good at signposting as well i feel i appreciate that mediation might not feel like the most natural way to uh start um, leaving an abusive relationship process but they do know what they're talking about and, and can also help as well um, now questions wise we've, we've got a handful um, uh, a little bit of guidance from you if possible Karen one of the questions here is that the um, the listener makes me sound like a radio show if I call them a listener um, says that they've been with the husband for a very long time and the children are older now the children are expressing their views and they want that person to stay in uh, the marriage. Um, so how would you suggest, have you got any top tips for how this person would, would deal with that situation? It can be very difficult if your children are not happy about the, the even the thought that you might separate because, you know, you will be, as much as you might be ready to leave the relationship and the marriage and you might, you know, be chomping at the bit even to to, to leave now that the kids have grown up, you are saying goodbye to all of that history. And for children, that can be quite difficult. You know, they might have seen and heard a lot over the years. They might recognise that, you know, some of you know, their abusive parents' behaviour is is not great, it's not acceptable, etc. but he's still their parent at the end of the day. So they can be very conflicted. But I think, you know, this is your life and you have to take control over it. And if you've really thought this through, which I'm sure you have, because nobody just wakes up one morning and goes, right, I want to leave. You know, you will have thought through everything long and hard uh, before you even spoke to the children about it, I'm sure you have to you have to stick with it, and you have to say things like, "I appreciate that this is difficult for you. I appreciate that this may not be what you want to happen, but this is my life, and it is my choice. And you know, I'm afraid there is no other option. You know, I have to separate. I have to do this for me, and I will be doing it." So you have to stay very focused and be very clear and, you know, say, you know, maybe I appreciate that it is very difficult for you, um, but I will be here for you always. And hopefully, you know, the other parent will be too. And we'll try and get out of this as quickly as we can with the least amount of stress and we can all move on with our lives. So help them see that you're, you, you, you want things to be over and done with quite quickly and amicably if possible um so yeah you've got to stand your ground though it's your life and your needs matter you can't live your life for your children absolutely absolutely um and what you do they will remember forever but they will also recover yeah if it's yeah. not what they, um, they agree with um i think one of the brilliant points you made earlier was about um when you're thinking about leaving an abusive relationship building up a support team and trying to 
uh, I suppose it's, it's by securing a support team, you're giving yourself perspective and you're giving yourself confidence. One of the questions we've got here um, says that uh, somebody says they think that their relationship is abusive, but they are constantly questioning themselves, which I think is pretty a pretty common um, uh, situation to be in. And they're asking, how can I get my confidence back and trust trust in themselves? So first of all, the fact that you're questioning it is a good starting point. You know, if you're questioning it, something clearly feels very wrong to you. So definitely it is about educating yourself. If you go to the Women's Aid website, they've got lots of information on there about typical signs of behaviour. I've got signs of behaviour on my website. If you read my books, there's lots of um, information in there about tactics. Um what I would say is don't get stuck just thinking about tactics or I have a, am I ticking enough boxes, if you like. If it doesn't feel right to you, then think about what needs to change. You know, you may have had conversations with your partner already about what needs to change. You may have, you know, suggested that they go to therapy. You might have tried marriage counselling. You have to think how long am I prepared to wait for things to change the reality is is if you are in a relationship with somebody that is abusive that is controlling that behavior is not going to change it's never going to change it doesn't matter how much therapy they get it doesn't matter how many sessions of marriage counseling you go to it won't change so the only way to change your situation is to start taking responsibility for your own happiness and to make those changes Okay, I'm um, I'm thinking we should probably do another session on this next month, maybe if you're free. We've got a lot <laughs> to talk about still. <laughs> um, I do have a, a couple of questions. Uh, well, I'd like to deal with one which is slightly more on the legal side of things, Karen, but I think you can shed some light on it with me because um, I think partly the media is to blame about this, but I've got somebody asking what kind of evidence a victim of abuse needs to prove coercive control at court. Well, frequently we've found that when people are talking about coercive control um, and being a victim of abuse, we we're looking at two different sort of scenarios. We're in a, a criminal court whereby someone's being prosecuted because it is now a criminal offence under the Domestic Abuse Act. But also frequently when people are divorcing, people will come to family lawyers and say, I'm a victim of coercive control what can you do about it in my settlement? One of these elements is easier to deal with, with the, and then the other in terms of what evidence do you need in a criminal court? And Karen, you're in a criminal court a lot more often, well, uh, more often than I am because I'm not in a criminal court or in the family courts, which is civil. Um, but if you are in a situation whereby you are talking about coercive control and being in a victim of abuse in a, in a criminal court, then you are not alone. It is not for you to put forward all the evidence someone will have been through with you, what kind of evidence you have and assessed the case to ascertain what you still need to gather perhaps, or, or what is suitable, what is to be admitted. Is this the sort of thing you talk to um, the people you go to court with, Karen? Sure, yeah. And there are lots. It, it can be difficult to evidence coercive control uh, for criminal proceedings, but there are many different forms of evidence that you can try to gather to build your case. So, for example, you may have diaries where you've written down your experiences over the marriage. Um, they can be used to show the impact of that abusive behaviour on you. You may be able to provide witness statements from people who have seen that deterioration in your behaviour, that isolation, the fact that you used to, you know, be a very sociable person, you used to do all these different things, and then gradually over the marriage that has kind of depleted. Uh, you may be able to provide bank statements to show financial abuse. Maybe if you were having to... Uh, have your uh, income paid into your spouse's bank account, not your own bank account, or you were forced to take out loans, for example. So there may be those kind of things. There's a, there's a quite a big, long, comprehensive list, actually, um, of 
types of evidence that you can gather if you want to report that coercive control to the police. I'm not saying it's an easy case to build, um, but there definitely have been uh, people that have been convicted of coercive control. So, yeah, if you want to go down that route, um, you know, I'm happy to advise anybody about about that. Um, Fabulous. That's brilliant. And it's it's fairly similar if you're looking at divorce and it, it's mainly financial abuse where we are looking at things like the bank statements. Obviously, we we know we're looking at the evidence there. Um, proving coercive control in divorce cases isn't something that that is happening necessarily because you're if you're in court talking about your divorce or rather your financial settlement upon divorce, it is cold hard pounds and pence. And there are very, very few instances of conduct, as we refer to it as, of domestic abuse that would swing a case in your direction um, if, if abuse were found to be existing in, in that case. But I think the principle is the same. I'm getting off uh, subject here, aren't I? But the principle is the same, that if you can be, and I appreciate how difficult this is when you're in the thick of it, if you could be as organised as you possibly can be by making notes, keeping a secret diary, um, be careful if you're putting notes on your phone, obviously, um, because if at a later date you are talking to a family lawyer because you need an injunction, for example, regarding occupation order, because um, you need to exclude somebody from the family home or you're looking for a non-molestation order, um, you will need to submit a statement and support. Uh, your lawyer will go through that with you, but it is your account of, of what's going on and your account of the behaviour that you need to be protected from, you and your children. Um, all the children need to be protected from, of course. Um, but there is there are lots of things out in the media about coercive control, lots of things about the, the Domestic Abuse Act, for example. And, and it's really easy, I've found, for people to misinterpret what the courts can actually do. We've talked about it before, and Karen's got first-hand experience of this. The system isn't perfect. Um, it, the, the law is there, but um, it doesn't always come to our rescue or produce the results that we feel that it should, um, which makes it very difficult for us as uh, legal professionals, very different for people, very difficult for people like Karen who are supporting victims, um, and it makes it very difficult for, for yourselves. But I think if you follow Karen's top tips in terms of um, getting yourself advice, getting yourself your support team, um, then then you're, you're, you're well on the road and someone in a professional capacity can assess whether or not your situation is one that should be before the courts. Does that help? I'm not sure if that was clear. Um, we all feel very passionately about this subject and I can quickly go off subject chaps. I'm sorry about this. Right, let's have a look at some, um, some other questions. Now, I saw a really good question about moving abroad. Ah, uh, uh, so, Okay, there's been an abusive, an abusive relationship. I don't know whether you are married or not, but there's a question about taking an 11 year old child abroad in Europe without letting an ex know. The ex is an abusive person. Um, there's no uh, Children Act proceedings in place. Um, and the child lives with the mum who's asking the question full time and sees the, sees their father uh every sunday by the looks of things okay difficult situation there you're obviously managing to co-parent despite the abuse so really well done on that front um it's not an easy thing to do um karen i think you've advised on that before helping to to co-parent um with an abusive ex um, it's really not an easy situation. I suspect, I think you need to go and pop and have a free session with a local um, family lawyer to talk fully about the facts of your current situation because you, if, you're, if the father of your child has parental responsibility, and I'm trying to, try, trying to keep this simple here, if they have parental responsibility, then you will need their permission to take them out of the country take your, your son out of the country. Um, but we need to know the length of the trip, for example, uh, and, and what have you. It may well be that once somebody is asked formally for their permission for you to remove 
uh, child to go away for a period, um, then they will give their consent willingly because there is very frequently very little uh, reason uh, not to, to give their permission. And if they are refusing to give their permission, then we go off to court. And most judges are very sensible about this, especially when it's giving a child a holiday. Crikey, you know. Um, right. So, Karen, is there anything you've spotted in the in the question in the, the webinar chat? I think we have more questions in the webinar chat tonight than we do in the Q and A. Um, that you'd like to answer, or you'd like to home in on. Um, let me have a little look. Loving the comment about there being too many um, male judges, that is evening up. Um, you will see that we are getting many more female judges. Um, I don't think that does impact the decisions that are being made in family law, but I appreciate that you, you may feel differently. But we're also seeing, interestingly, much younger judges being appointed, which I think is really helpful. Um, if that gives any reassurance. Um, uh, I've just I've just seen mm -hmm. one here about child maintenance, saying that um, there's lots of arrears over many years. Can you still go to child maintenance? Absolutely. Yes, you can. You can go to the child maintenance service. Um, you know, part of that parental responsibility is you know, paying for your the upkeep of your child. And if they haven't been doing it, then yes, absolutely, go. Um, and uh, it's very easy to do. You can go onto the child maintenance service online and uh, they'll come back to you fairly quickly. Um, I know the child maintenance service doesn't have the best reputation. They are improving. Um, they are definitely looking at financial abuse more. <laughs> Um, but they, you know, they can do certain things to try and reclaim that money for you um, in terms of, you know, attachment orders and bailiffs, et cetera. If people are trying to, um, you know, plead poverty and give excuses as to why they can't pay their maintenance, they are becoming much more aware about financial abuse and how it impacts. Um, so, yeah, definitely keep going. In fact, I just had a client recently um, who managed to get lots of arrears after quite a long time of persevering with the child maintenance, but she did get it in the end. So that's good. Well, that's brilliant. It is quite challenging sometimes because it feels quite labour intensive dealing with child maintenance service. But um, if you hang on in there um, and arrears you know, are, are due, then you will eventually get them. Um, hopefully, and the CMS, the Child Maintenance Service, have heard every um, every fib in the book, you know, from every uh, parent who doesn't want to pay. Mm. Uh, so they will take you seriously. Again, just as with um, anything else, if you could possibly be as organised as possible with um, the facts of the situation with your timeline, then that would be, that would be brilliant because they will ask you a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, anything else on somebody here? mentioned there about mediators um, mm -hmm. and I know you mentioned it earlier Sarah there are different variations of mediation now which again can make the process a bit more um, productive shall we say mm -hmm. when we're trying to deal with people that are controlling people that don't particularly like to negotiate mediators are you know very well trained in in dealing with people that are controlling now and historically we would have never adv advised or suggested that people went to mediation but actually it can be a really good starting point and um, you might or might not be aware that the government have an incentive um, still going at the moment where you can actually get a £500 voucher towards some of your mediation. So it's a bit of an incentive to try and keep people out of court and try and find that resolution a lot quicker. And if you are coming out of a long-term relationship, perhaps where the only particular issues are finances, you know, your children are older, so you don't really have any kind of legal stuff to be negotiating. Um, it's purely just finances and assets. 
um, you know, mediation can be a really good process, a really quite simple, fruitful process where you don't have, particularly have to spend out a lot of money. Um, of course, That's you know, how, how how well it goes is quite dependent on your ex's behaviour and how willing they are to engage, but it can be a really good starting point. Okay. To, to carry that theme on a little bit further, we are going to be seeing... Uh, a change in in the rules when we're talking about divorce and finances so if you're married you're getting divorced you need a final financial settlement to bring your financial claims to an end it will often deal with you know who's having the house or is the house being sold you know is someone financially supporting the other that sort of thing so that in that kind of remit we are seeing a change in the rules at the end of this month literally the 29th of um, April in which there is going to be um, a bigger push to ensure that parties properly consider and engage in what we call as lawyers, we call it non-court dispute resolution. This means in practical terms that rather than just say you thought about mediation but you don't fancy it, um, if you are the party who says that you know this is a case where we can be doing mediation because we want to keep the costs down, we want to keep the level of um, uh, discontent down, for example, you have the opportunity to threaten what we call threaten costs. So you have an opportunity to recoup some of your legal costs. If somebody refuses um, something like mediation or refuses arbitration um, or refuses um, a, a non-court based, what I call a financial dispute resolution hearing, so a round table meeting um, unreasonably. Um, I'm not going to labor that or go into it in more detail because um, it's not quite uh, I, as I say, I fear I will go off on a bit of a tangent for us. It's not all applicable uh, to, to everybody, but there, there will be more of a pressure. The rules are changing for people to consider um, non-court dispute resolution. Now, if you are a victim of abuse, that's an important thing for you to know, because we could find that abusers are going to be pushing victims into a situation where they're sat in a room across from them. If you find yourself in that situation and somebody is pressuring you to go to mediation, they're saying, you know, if you don't go to mediation, you're going to have to pay my legal costs, whatever. You can still take part in mediation. You can do something called shuttle mediation um, or you can do uh, mediation uh, remotely. Um, but but first and foremost, I'd suggest go and see um, a legal professional, select one locally who you like the look of um, and make sure you get that free appointment and start planning how you're going to be dealing with that. Um, sorry, I took us down a bit of a rabbit hole there. Sorry, Karen. No, 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 no that's <laughs> fine, because mediation has changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, traditional mediation, the thought of sitting in front of the person that's been abusing you, you know, would never be, you know, comfortable and, and easy or something that we would have ever recommended. But it has really changed so much, you know, with things like hybrid mediation and, like you say, shuttle mediation and those different variables. Um, it's it definitely makes it a more comfortable process. Um, yeah. It's um, it's interesting actually how recent some changes have been made. Um, you know, for example, the prohibition of cross-examining, um, you know, the abuser cross-examining the, the, the victim um, in a court situation. I was reading something earlier today um, about the criminal injuries compensation scheme there used to be a rule um, that if you'd been a victim of violent crime before 1979, which in the grand scheme of things, although we're in 2024 now, 1979 isn't that long ago, there was something called a same roof rule, that if you lived under the same roof as somebody and you were a victim of violent crime before 1979, then you weren't actually eligible for compensation under the criminal injuries um, compensation scheme. But that rule wasn't abolished until 2019. It's bonkers, isn't it? Yeah, that anyway, is bonkers. <laughs> sorry, I'm taking us off uh, in a different direction again. Right, where are we? Half past six. Crikey, time has flown tonight. Um, it's a really difficult subject. Um, these sessions are really important. All of us involved uh, really... I, I say enjoy doing them. Um, we think they're important to do and we like to share our knowledge with everybody who signs up. Um, 
and, and, and obviously answer whatever questions we can. I appreciate that in this forum, it's not always easy to go down uh, in depth with answering people's questions, but hopefully we've done our role tonight in terms of informing you, um, sharing our knowledge. Karen is awesome. She knows, I think she's awesome. Um, her signposting is brilliant. Um, I like the book, obviously, as I said before, I've got my post-it notes all over my book. Um, and I really kind of recommend that if you do need somebody uh, like Karen, that you reach out um, sooner rather than later. I love the bit that she talks about gut feel, trust your gut if something's not right. It's not right, really. So we're going to be doing Stow Talks again uh, in probably about four weeks time, I believe. But uh, details will be coming out on email uh, in due course. Um, as I say, we love feedback. Let us know what you think. Um, we really appreciate you giving up your Wednesday evenings uh, to, to share with us um, and, and to engage and obviously ask questions. If there's anything that we've missed or we haven't got to, then let us know. Um, contact, Karen's contact details are available um, as are ours at Stowe's. Um, and I think that's that's all for tonight. So um, Karen, huge thanks from us, as always, for giving up your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank You're you. welcome. Right. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And we'll Take see care, you later, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Oh, sound yeah. Jerry Springer. Look after each other. There you go. <laughs> Good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.